Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and today I'm going to be playing a game that's currently in early access. It's being published by Slytherin Limited, and um, it's called Buzz Aldrin's Space Program Manager. It is the spiritual successor to the Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space game of, I believe, the early 1990s, which put you in charge of either NASA or the Soviet Union in the race to the moon. This is, as I said, the spiritual successor to that game. Uh, it has Buzz Aldrin's name on it, of course. He's uh, an advisor in the project. And uh, the game is in early access right now, available through Slytherin or Matrix Games, uh, the publishers of the game. Um, we're going to be playing this here in a couple of episodes that I'm going to break apart and um, look at well, just how successful I can be. Now, when the game first came out last fall, I believe it was, all it had in terms of playability was a GSA campaign and a GSA sandbox. The GSA stands for Global Space Agency, and this was going to basically clump together a whole lot of historical programs, uh, Russian programs such as Sputnik, and American programs such as Explorer and Apollo, and clump them all into one kind of hypothetical global space agency. For example, let's say the world came together in the 1950s and decided we want to go to the moon, and then used all the historical um, you know, tools and whatnot for that objective. Now, I will say that this is one of the great examples of early access, and one of the few examples, I would say, of early access allowing a game to shape itself better to meet what its customers wanted. So that was the only version of the game, but basically players like you and me came out and said, listen, no. Uh, having a global space agency idea is fine, you can do that if you want, but you have to have a race to the moon between Russia and the United States. If the objective is getting to the moon and all you're doing is racing some arbitrary deadline or clock or budget, and racing yourself basically, it's not a race into the moon. It's not a race to space. It's not going to accurately capture the space race era if all you're doing is having these kind of programs with no real goal. So, the developers listened and implemented two whole new versions of the game, a NASA sandbox and campaign and a Soviet sandbox and campaign. Uh, now, as I said, the game is still in early access. The Soviet campaign is still uh, a bit far from done. There are several rocket programs and whatnot that are, are not completed yet. The GSA appears to be mainly complete, but that element of the game doesn't interest me too much. And the NASA campaign is not finished yet, but the sandbox is pretty close to being done. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and play here today. We're going to break it up into a couple of episodes, and we're going to go ahead and play uh, Buzz Aldrin's Space Program Manager. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, when you get started, You've got the choice, basically, of playing either normal, hard, or buzz hard, which uh, I assume is just supposed to be, you know, ultra realistic. Um, but anyway, we're gonna go to. We're just gonna play normal because I really haven't put a whole lot of time into this game. I did play a little bit of the initial release, but this game is almost an entirely new game since some of the redesigns which occurred during this early access program, and in that sense it's very, very, very new to me. So let's go ahead and get into it, and as you can see here we started, and you get a news bulletin basically every turn that comes up and tells you what's going on. Uh, basically it says that the National uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration has been established, its first administrator has been appointed, that's me and will be in charge of man managing the agency's budget and assuring that we become, America becomes the leader in space exploration. It also lets us know uh, that there are several scientists which are now uh, available for assignment. So let's go ahead and proceed. Alright, so as you can see here, we've got a little bit of a briefing. Uh, you can see we've got a budget here with which to obtain our goals. Uh, we have a budget of four, for the next four years, we have a budget of $3,000 uh, per turn. Um, and our goal is to get a minimum of 250 prestige, uh, which would grant us a budget of $3,500. Or if we get up to 2,500 prestige, uh, we will get a budget of $7,500 per season, respectively, once this budget period for the next four years ends, so once we get to 1959. 
It is 1955, as you can see up here. Uh, turns take place in four turns per year, one per quarter. Uh, we start with 250 prestige, and this is the NASA Space Complex that you see on the screen here. Um, so we can take a look. There's various buildings. If we click this magnifying glass, it'll let us know what these different buildings are. Uh, so starting at number one, we have an at or not center, which has not yet been constructed. We'll definitely need that at some point. Uh, we have at number two a public affairs office, which basically just gives us a summary of our current budget, the number of seasons until the next budget review. So 16 seasons, four quarters times four years is 16. Uh, we have the lowest number of prestige for the budget, the highest number of prestige. I assume if we finish below that low, we get fired, uh, but I'm not sure. Again, remember, we're playing the sandbox, so it's not really a race against the Russians at this point, uh, but that element of the game will be available once uh, once we get, once the game is launched. And then our, you know, projected budget at next review as of today uh, also gives us our total current funds and allows us to budget ourselves. Total salaries, total flight controller salaries, astronaut salaries, salaries of set, which is basically scientists, uh, expedition or er, expenditures for facilities, different buildings, uh, total funds being spent, and our current budget. So basically you get the budget and the expenses and then you get your quarterly balance. So right now we're turning a profit of 2400 per turn um, because we really aren't building anything yet. So if we go back here, we'll see that number three is the headquarters area. This is the area where you manage your rocket programs, manage your satellite programs. You can click on different planets to see essentially uh, what we're going to be doing with that. So we clicked on Earth, and then I clicked a little bit quick there, but you can see when you click on Earth, you've got various different programs available. So you've got Earth orbiting satellites, space planes, uh, ballistic capsules for one people, two people, and three people. So basically, Mercury would be the one person, Gemini would be the two person, and Apollo would be the three person. Excuse me there. And um, you can click on those programs in order to open the programs and begin researching them so you can actually uh, launch those. There are also um, rocket programs which can be initiated here so you can open the rocket programs you see you've got a Jupiter C booster, Juno 2, Thor Abel, Redstone. There are quite a few different historical rocket programs uh, which can be researched at various times. Uh, all the historical programs all the way through uh, the Saturn V rocket which uh, took the Americans to the moon. The Russian version of the game has similar options as well. And it's not just missions to Earth that are to the Earth or to the moon. Uh, you can launch probes to Jupiter. Now we don't have any available right now, but for example, there's the Pioneer 10 Jupiter flyby probe. There are lunar probes as well, such as the Pioneer probe. Uh, there you see the Pioneer 3, Ranger 3, Pioneer 2. And again, the Russians have their own versions as well, even probes to the sun, the uh, Pioneer Sun Orbiter. Um, so lots of different options and missions, and uh, all based on historical uh, missions. That's all controlled from the headquarters. Uh, then you have number four, which is mission control. That's where you launch your, your missions from. Now, as you can see here, we haven't had anything built there either, so that's something we'll have to correct soon. Uh, we've got a museum. Well, we haven't done anything yet worth commemorating in a museum, so that's kind of pointless. Um, number six is the set center. That is the uh, area where we have uh, scientists who can research and um, attempt to help us on our way in building new rockets and programs and whatnot. Now we start off with uh, five scientists. Uh, the maximum you can have researching any one program is four, uh, but I don't think that's going to be enough. Uh, in fact, I know it's not going to be enough. These early years are incredibly important for NASA, uh, despite the fact that we're still some 14 years away from when NASA historically went to the moon in 1955. Uh, when they went in 1969, but right now we're, we're in 1955. Despite the fact that we're so far away, uh, a lot of these early years were really spent testing and designing and uh, implementing a lot of the rockets and, and programs that would come down the line. Uh, no one was really thinking that the Saturn rocket would be the rocket that would take men to the moon in the early 1950s or mid-1950s, but the Saturn 1, the first version of the Saturn 
rocket which would lead to the Saturn V was developed and tested in the 1950s. And in fact, uh, the Saturn 1B was tested in the late 1950s, and that was the first Apollo spacecraft to bring men into orbit. Um, and continued in operations even after the moon missions because it was taking astronauts up to space uh, to get to, um, what was it, uh, the, oh my goodness, I can't remember it, the American Space Station, the first American, Skylab, the first American Space Station. Uh, the Saturn 1B was in operation into the 1970s. So um, it's going to be important that we get to, get to work here um, hiring more scientists so let's go ahead and do that there you can see there's a higher option and then it brings you into a available recruits section and each recruit has uh, three well several major traits so for example this guy status label is 38 percent at rockets out of, it's out of 165 percent at space probes 39 percent at human rated rockets 39 percent at crewed spacecraft and 38 percent for EVA suits so extra vehicular activity suits basically spacesuits in addition to that, he's got a light bulb here, which I believe indicates his ability to improve, and these figures can go up with time and research, a heartbeat, which is for morale, and a dollar sign, which is how much you have to pay him each turn. Um, also, the age is important because scientists will retire after a certain amount of time. Um, so let's take a look here. He looks like he'd be a great guy to hire specifically for space probes, and, so, uh, and since a lot of our early work is going to be done uh, with space probes, and he's really cheap. You can see he's only $26 per turn. Or if you see everyone else is gonna, looks like they're all higher than that. So he's a good deal, especially for space probes. Um, so let's go ahead and hire him. Now we've got, uh, are they all named status? Oh, these are status labels. That's not his name. Okay, never mind. I'm stupid. Uh, I don't see a name though. That's interesting. Um, yeah, no names. Anyway, uh, names will show up later. I know they do. So I'm not sure why we don't see a name right now. Uh, but anyway, and I believe photos will probably appear as well once we get through the early access. In fact, I think one of the elements of early access was if you bought a higher level of the game, you could get your photo into the game or something like that. Um, but anyway, so the next guy up on the list here is 31. He's more expensive at $40 per turn, but he's really good with human-rated rockets at 60, which again is going to be important when it comes to developing uh, spacecraft. And he's also going to be... Well, not really good at anything else. So let's go down the list here. Next guy down really isn't good at anything. But he's cheap. Um, we could hire this guy. He's a 63. He's also got a 59% on crewed spacecraft, which isn't bad. And he's only $28 a turn. Uh, also very high science, so should have the ability to develop. So we'll go ahead and hire him. And let's see, what else do we want? Uh, this guy down here is good with EVA suits. He's also good. He's kind of pretty well balanced. He might not be a bad pick. Oh, wait, no. Let's see. Peter Phillips here, the, one of the guys that actually has a name, uh, is 38. He's cheap at 31, and he's also got human-rated rockets of 70%, so we'll definitely hire him. Uh, okay, so apparently we can only hire two more people. Um, let's drop this guy because we don't need to, to put too much focus on space probes. And let's go for Peter Phillips. So we'll go ahead and hire these two recruits. They're the only two we can hire at the moment. And now uh, they'll go into training here, so we won't have them right away. Um, but basically here we've got several empty buildings, or empty zones. We need to build number seven, which is a vehicle assembly thing, because we can't start researching any rockets until we actually build a vehicle assembly location. So we'll go ahead and uh, switch us into the building section here and uh, we're going to go ahead and construct a vehicle assembly building. It's our last stop before launching a mission. Uh, you can assemble the mission there, so basically assembling the rockets there, and assign the flight controllers and astronauts. Uh, we do... we can have... this building will allow us to have a maximum of four concurrent rocket programs, and um, we'll only be able to open lightweight rocket programs initially, so we'll have to upgrade the program over time in order to um, have larger rockets, so you can't just build a Saturn V right out of the gate, which makes sense. Um, so now we're going to close the construction window. We're building a vehicle assembly building, and uh, let's go ahead and go back in here. Now you can see we've got 11 potential programs. That's what the number on the right here recommend or references. Zero is how many we have open. So the only thing we can open any programs with right now is human flight. 
uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at Earth orbiting research satellites because I think the first program we're going to want is a um, is a satellite around the Earth. So you can see here we haven't opened this program yet. We can click on any one of these missions, which these are the two different types of missions that the Explorer satellite has. Or we can just choose Open Program, which we will. You can see there's a cost there of $1,026, but we've got over $20,000, so that's a one-time cost. We'll go ahead and open it up. And then by clicking on the Explorer, it gives us different mission components. We can click here. That's a question mark for the type of rocket, but we don't have uh, any rocket programs open. We also don't have... Well, actually, never mind. We can click here. So we, these are all the different types of rockets we could potentially launch that satellite from. However, you will notice uh, we cannot open the programs because we don't have a vehicle assembly building. Now we already have that queued up and in construction, but we have to wait two turns till it's done. So in the meantime, what we can do is we can look at the Explorer here is available to us. We can go ahead and click the research and development section and we can assign some astronaut or we can assign some scientists here uh, to begin researching the actual satellite uh, even though we're not yet ready for um, the rocket. So we'll assign these three guys 61%, 59, and 55. And then I want to see, I don't know if I can start researching a space plane, but I'm going to try here. We'll see. Space plane. Well, the X-15 experimental space plane, we'll go ahead and open that up. And can we research it? Yes, because it's not a rocket, we can research it. So crude spacecraft here. You can see, though, the guys we've got left, they're not terribly good at crude spacecraft, but we did hire two guys, uh, one of them who's a 70 at, at crude spacecraft. So um, I'm not sure... Let's see here, space probes 55 and 53, that's kind of a wash, so we'll bring in Mina because she's pretty pretty balanced all around. Um, so we'll bring her in, it won't hurt the other program too much at 53%. And I don't know if there's anyone else we can bring? Eh, I guess we'll just stick it out there with the, the bad, bad scientists for researching human spacecraft. Um, one other nice thing is you can actually manage your programs from this main screen. Rather than having to go through each one of those individual layers, we can just choose Manage Programs here and uh, manage it all from the main screen. So we can go back here and see that we've got this uh, Explorer program open. We've still got one scientist who's at 40%. And yeah, so that's going to just about do it here for the first turn. We've got everything somewhat set up and ready to go. Uh, so we'll go ahead and advance on to turn two. We'll end the season. We could build a mission control center and an astronaut center, but at this point I think we're far enough away from needing those. I don't want to waste the money. You can see we've got plus $2,000 for the turn still, and we have $21,000 left. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, advance past our first turn. All right, so in between turns, you can see here that we get a status update on the research. Uh, we can see there's the Explorer satellite, which is being researched. Uh, it started at, it looks like, about 23%. It improved by 22%, and we're up to a total of 25% reliability. The closer to 100% you get, the more reliable that equipment is, and if you launch a mission with it, the less likely it is to fail. Uh, you can see here the X-15 space plane also had pretty dramatic improvement, uh, up to 20%, uh, starting down at as low as 3. So we'll go ahead and proceed. We'll get our bulletin. We've got two scientists here that are undergoing basic training, which means we can't assign them to anything yet. And we've opened these two programs here. Now, we got another pop-up here that says the budget will be constant during the first four years. After that, our prestige points will be available evaluated against target goals which will determine our budget for the next four years. We've already visited the Public Affairs Office. Uh, that was this office here which gives us our budget. And you can see here we're still on pace for turning a $2,100 profit per turn. We'll just keep banking that money. We don't really need to spend the money on anything else yet. We're still building the vehicle assembly base so we also can't start researching rockets yet either. Um, but actually because we can only we could only hire two more scientists I am going to go ahead and expand the set center, the science center, uh, for $1,000 over the next two seasons, because I want to be able to have more scientists than this.
Democrats. I did mention earlier uh, that the most important part, especially in these early years for the United States, is getting a good handle on researching and uh, getting, getting basically a good head start on rocket development and space programs and all of that. So we'll do that and then we'll go ahead and end that second turn and you can see here the space program projects continue to improve another 18 percent improvement on these, uh, the satellite up to 43 percent reliability and the human spacecraft as well up to 34 um, percent so it is now you can see here these scientists have graduated from basic training and a significant technical discovery will boost the results of your R&D by 15% for the next four seasons. So that's nice. There are random events, uh, just like in the original Buzz Aldrin Space uh, or Race to the Moon it was. Uh, there are events that can either help or hinder your progress into space. And that was a good example of one of them. We get better R&D for the next couple of turns, which will certainly come in handy. Um, so we're working on this. Now with the... Uh, training of those two new, new scientists. I'm actually going to back out of here and um, take all of my scientists off their current projects because I want to add a new project. I want to add a rocket project, but I don't uh, know who's going to go best where, so I'd rather just kind of start fresh with my R&D so I can better allocate everyone uh, to give us the best possible prog progress. Now, as you can see here, if we want to open up a rocket program you can go another way but I'm gonna go in in this route we'll click on this question mark and uh, again it says no rocket programs have been open so click yes and you can see here we've got these two rocket programs open as well as the Atlas booster so we've got three rocket programs open the rest of them are not open yet because well we don't have an advanced vehicle assembly base enough and you will learn that if you just immediately try and jump into researching the Saturn V and going straight for the moon, one, you probably don't have enough money there. You can see opening cost is $12,000. It's over half of our budget. And it's incredibly difficult. So relative R&D difficulty factor, 100%. That means it's incredibly difficult to just flat up start researching it. I believe, although I'm not 100% sure, that as you research some of these other rockets, they give you experience, which then helps you advance these rockets quicker and gives you better starting points. So most of the research you saw start on the last uh, couple of units, for example, the Explorer satellite, all started out pretty much at 0% reliability. But your experience with other programs can give you a head start and um, makes your scientists better, but can also give you a start where maybe you start at 20% or 30% reliability as soon as you open the program. So we've got two rockets available for the satellite, and then we've also got the Atlas booster available. I'm not going to start researching the Atlas booster yet. Um, we really don't have enough scientists to go for a manned program. It is a human-rated rocket, you can see here, uh, which is different than other rockets. These rockets just show being rockets. Basically, a human-rated rocket means it has certain, certain safety features uh, which are required for NASA to consider it safe to carry human beings into space, whereas a non-human rocket doesn't have to have all those safety features, doesn't need an escape tower or other things like that uh, for humans to be safe. Now the rockets that we have to choose from for our satellites are the Jupiter-C or the Juno-2. They're actually both based off of the Redstone rocket, uh, which would be used to um, get the first manned flights into space. Um, I don't see the Redstone on here, interestingly enough. Uh, but it is, you can research it, it is a rocket available. Um, I'm going to go with researching the Juno 2. Now one thing you need to keep in mind whenever you look at a new rocket program is it'll give you some information, it'll give you the opening cost, it'll give the cost per unit, initial reliability here you see at 3%, uh, maximum research and development reliability, so it's maximum reliability is almost on par with the Jupiter C here, both at about 90 for 90.4%, 90.3%. Uh, relative R&D difficulty factor, 23% versus 19%. So the Jupiter C is easier to research. Um, but here's where I'm going to go with it. They're pretty close. Relative research difficulty is a little bit harder on the Juno 2. But max payload to suborbital, 200 kilograms. That's four times the payload weight that the Jupiter C can carry. It also can carry 42 kilograms into low Earth orbit, which you have to be able to carry something into Earth orbit if your intention is to get into space. A suborbital basically is like a ballistic missile where it comes up and comes straight back down. It doesn't go into orbit. Um, and low Earth orbit would be 
actually putting something in orbit. And then TLI, which is only 6 kilograms, but I, I believe what that means is it has the capability to carry something beyond Earth orbit. Um, so to break Earth orbit. Um, I believe that means the payload it can put into lunar insertion, I believe is PLI lunar insertion, because I know the Juno 2 was used for some of the moon probes. So this will kind of kill two birds with one stone in that we can use the Juno 2 to get our first satellites up, but then we can also use it to get um, like the Pioneer space program to the moon as well. It'll save us on some R&D down the line. So even though it's a little bit more expensive, I think in the long term, it'll save us some money. So that's why I'm going to go with the Ju Juno 2 rocket here. So we'll open that program and we'll go ahead and we'll start researching um, we'll start researching the Juno 2 booster. You can see here we have the one guy we just recently hired who's 72 percent on rockets so we definitely want to put him on there, Carlos Dorothy. Um, the next several guys, this guy is much higher, Clyde Ash is higher on space probes at 61%. Um, Mina Burroughs is a little bit higher on space probes. Uh, Peter Phillips is better on human rated rockets. Let's see, I'm not sure what I want to do uh, this, with this. Um, looks like the best kind of balance would be to put Clyde Ash here. And then on the Explorer program with the space probes, we'll go with Vanessa Render, Felicia um, McClard, and Mina Burroughs. So we'll put three guys on that program. Um, hmm. Yeah, we've only got two more scientists. So we'll leave it three and two. And then what we're also going to do is we're going to go ahead and put the two remaining scientists into the um, X-15 space plane program, because that's another program that we're still in the middle of researching. We don't want to forget about that. Uh, and we'll go ahead and put these guys in here as well. And again, that's definitely not enough scientists yet, so I'm turning a 1600, even opening these programs. One other thing, programs have annual costs uh, that have to be paid here, so you can see... Um, doesn't look like it breaks it out, but there are costs to maintain these programs each turn. So every, you know, the more programs you have open, uh, the harder it is to um, fund your other programs. Basically, it pays to cancel programs after they're no longer being used. Uh, but anyway, so let's go ahead and end that turn. That's really all we can do here this turn. We'll go ahead and end that session, or season. And uh, you can see here we're making progress on the Explorer. It's up to almost 60% reliability. The uh, X-15 is almost to 50%. And the Juno 2 got a nice big jump there right away. 19% up to 22% here. Um, so there are those bulletins. No news this season. And we're almost nearing the end of our first year uh, as a space program, as NASA. So what we're going to do here, now that the construction has finished at the set facility, Apparently we can't hire any more this year. That's one other thing, I guess. You can only hire once a year. Um, so, really not much else for us to do here. Let's go ahead and end this turn as well and progress into 1956. So our first year is in the books. Uh, you can see the progress on the uh, various research projects slows over time. So initially you get big jumps year to year in terms of reliability, but as you become further and further along into the program, your advancements slow as you reach the maximum research uh, or maximum reliability standard, which makes sense, you know, if you think about it, when you initially put in uh, a new project, a lot of the basic safety measures, a lot of the basic design uh, comes very quickly, and then as you refine the project to make it as good as you possibly can, that's when you start to see things slow down and each individual change is kind of declining. It's a, a, a situation of diminishing returns. Each, each turn you research it, you gain less and less. And it's one of the key aspects to this game is balancing uh, whether you want to continue researching or whether you think it's safe enough to make a launch and uh, risk the failure, which can, can be disastrous depending on the mission.
You can see there it's slowing down for the X15 as well, up to about 57%. I don't know about you, but I definitely wouldn't send pilots up yet uh, with a vehicle that's at only 57% reliable. And then the Juno 2 rocket as well, uh, which is up to 38%. So we'll go ahead and proceed, and uh, no news bulletins, and we're into 1956. Uh, so that's kind of a, a quick overview of the start of my game here. Uh, we're into 1956, obviously, as I just said. And uh, I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the first episode of uh, my uh, Let's Play or my playthrough or walkthrough or whatever you want to call this of Buzz Aldrin Space Program Manager. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, if you did, please, you know, like and subscribe and tune in, because I'm going to be covering this game uh, in a lot more detail as I work through. Uh, I've already mentioned it once, but I will say I am absolutely floored by a lot of the improvements that have been made to this game, and uh, really excited to kind of get into playing this game more. And um, we'll probably start next turn with hiring some scientists and uh, expanding our research and really going for it and trying to get as much done as soon as possible. Uh, we need to start earning that prestige right now because we're still sitting on that 250 base prestige we started with and we've only got three years more to get it up to 2,500 if we want the max budget. And I definitely want to get the max budget because the more money you have, the more you can research. It's a cyclical uh, situation. You definitely want uh, to get as much money as you can because that in turn allows you to speed things up. But anyway, um, that's going to do it for the first episode here of my Buzz Aldrin Space Program Manager uh, AAR Let's Play walkthrough. And uh, I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you like this, go ahead and subscribe. And I'm going to be trying to upload these uh, maybe once a week is kind of the game plan. I've been doing some uh, war game uh, Red Dragon about once a week. So my goal is to get to the Space Program Manager out about once a week as well. Uh, and we'll see what else we do here. But uh, again, I appreciate you tuning in. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.